Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to be with you today, and thank you all very much for coming. Uh, like I said, I'm, my name is Rolf Kars Jansen, and I'm from Alberta, Canada. And I bring you the greetings from our, our warm climate. Uh, we, we do get up to quite warm. Actually, I was in Oklahoma just a few weeks ago, and it was 65 degrees in Oklahoma, and it was 90 degrees at home. So we do experience some very nice warm weather. Um, before we uh, begin, I'd like to start in a word of prayer, so you please join me. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, it is a true blessing that we are called thy children, and we ask, Father, that thou wilt look upon us in grace, and thou wilt hear our prayers, not because we are worthy, but only out of grace in the name and the work of thy Son. We pray at this time also, Father, that it will be with this convention, that it may be a blessing to those who are attending, and that the vendors may have a a good turnout. And Father, we pray that the people here that have come and gathered, that we may all be edified together as we approach thy word and discuss matters also concerning, concerning storytelling. And we pray, Father, that also, as we just heard of an emergency, that things may go well. And we do not know the circumstances, but we know that thou art in control and let's take care of everything. We ask that thou wilt give us a good time together, that we may learn what it is to bring glory to thy holy name. This we ask in the forgiveness of our sins, for Jesus' sake only. Amen. Well, my, the purpose of my speech that I'm doing today uh, is because as I've been traveling, and this is my third year traveling, doing different homeschool con conferences, I've seen uh, a lot of people, and, and I go to a lot of conferences, I see a lot of people, but what's really shocked me is that a lot of the people that I meet, and homeschoolers, they are identical to the world around them. And I find that very distracting, uh, especially because we're homeschoolers. We're supposed to be the more conservative Christians, and yet we seem to do the exact same things as the world. And I think there's, there's three main reasons that, that, that I kind of see First one, and I think very few people have an excuse for this one, is ignorance. I think very few people, or sometimes there's people that, that just don't realize it. Uh, they, they go around and, um, and that's just what they do and who they are. And they don't seem to realize that, the, that there's things attached to that that are very worldly. The second reason, and I think that's, this is a, a, um, a very bad reason, but it's, people seem to uh, think it to be a very good reason, and that is that somehow I think we think that if we can be like the world, look like the world, do everything the world does, it will be accepted by the world, so that at one point, when we've been accepted and everybody thinks that we're just like them, we can catch them off guard and surprise them by saying, but I'm a Christian. However, in my experience, I have found that many people who, who have this approach of being like the world, doing everything the world does, when a push comes to shove, they don't talk about their faith. And it's, it's very sad. And then the third reason, and that is the reason that I think that is very important, the one that we'll be talking about today, is the world is influencing us in our homes often through modern media. And especially the television. The television is an is a, is extreme danger. And children especially are very susceptible to a lot of the evils that the television brings in. And often, we don't even realize it. And Christians often take an approach of, we, not, we watch the neutral programs, or we watch the Christian programs. Well, the neutral programs don't exist. Because... If there, there is no neutral ground. Christ says, if you're not for me, you're against me. He doesn't leave any room, any wiggle room there. So as we, as we approach this, I think we've got to realize that we're, if we're not for God, we're against him. And in America today, we are losing our men and women, our godly men and women. And I think that's because of the television. Amongst other reasons, but I think the television is very strong 
in shaping Christian men like the world and Christian women. And I, I was talking to a, a couple uh, just a few weeks ago, and they're in my booth, and we're looking through some books. And they say, well, you know, maybe a year ago we, we, we might have considered buying these books, but a friend recently gave our son a, a, some video game, and ever since he stopped reading. Well, my first response was, well, get rid of it. I said, it's easy, just throw it away. And like, well, you know, like, oh, he, he enjoys it, and, and he likes it, and it kind of keeps him busy, he's by himself. That's fine, get rid of it. Give him a book, give him a good book to read. And I really think that reading has a much better effect on people than playing these video games. Um, and I was, I was talking to someone else also recently, and, and he mentioned that it's actually a surprise how little attack there is on homeschooling. And I think that's because homeschool parents, they've, they've taken their children out of the public school, and socialism and the, and the culture around us have kind of said, okay, that's fine. You, you can do that as long as you teach them the things that we want you to teach them. And that's what's happening. In the homeschool world, ch parents have taken their children out of the public school, have taken them into the home, that are teaching them the exact same things as what the public school system teaches them. And if you look around, you see all these, all these homeschool organizations, all these homeschool co-ops, uh, where, where they, the children, they, they come together, do classes. They do homeschool, homeschool children go to school a number of days a week to do homeschool classes as a school. And we have homeschool sports, organized sports. We've got homeschool activities. All the, homeschool, all the activities that are in the public school are now available as homeschool activities. And, and the very reason that... Um, I think it was John Dewey, that he said we've got to start the public school system. It is because if you can take the children away from their parents, put them in a group that's their own age, roughly their own age, 90% of the time, after one year, they'll be closer to their friends than to their parents. And that's true for homeschooled families as well, when their children are gone almost every day doing some homeschool activity. And I was, another family that I just met, and I was staying with them. I got there, it was later in the evening, and, and I, I think I arrived there, it was just after 8 o'clock. They hadn't had supper yet, so we're going to have supper together, we're going to have dinner together. And so everybody gets called upstairs, and they have, they have five children. The moment supper was done, the moment they were done eating, they like, can we be excused, we've got homework to do. So they go downstairs and do their homework. And then about an hour later, some of we... They called him upstairs again and said, oh, we're going to do family worship. And so here they all come, and the moment it's done, we've got to do our homework. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, is that all there is to it? Is that, is that all that we homeschool for, just to, to give them the education that we're so afraid that they need, we, th we think they need it? Um, I, think, I think personally we've got to take a step back. and We've got to look at education from a biblical perspective. And... We've got to take a look at what education really is. And there, there's, there's room uh, for academic education. I'm not opposed to academic education. However, I don't think academic education should be our number one thing, our number one reason for homeschooling. If we homeschool merely to get better grades, we've missed the point. We need to homeschool because we want to raise young men and women who are able and willing to take a godly stand in our nation and take leadership. And that's not going to happen merely because they've got their grades. That's going to happen if we open the word of God with them and we teach them the word of God. And we use the word of God as their primary education. And all education should come from the word of God. Even our math and our sciences and our grammars and all these other subjects should flow out of the Word of God. If they are done separated from the Word of God, I think we've missed a point. Now, some shocking facts about TV, why TV is really so bad. And I have here a, um, a little pamphlet. It's written by Joel Beakey. And it says, is, it, the title is, is, real, is TV really 
that bad. And I'd strongly encourage you to pick up some of these. I've got some here, and um, there's more. There's a, a booth right next to mine. There are um, Loving Truth books and gifts, and they hand these out. Um, there's, there's something in here that I'd like to read. And it's, this is Joel Beakey. I think he wrote this about 10 years ago. So statistics have changed. Unfortunately, they've not changed for the better, but they've become worse. Um, so here, he, he, he kind of goes through what TV does, what TV is, and here he writes, and I quote, man does not control TV. The sin box controls him. Only one study of many will prove this point. Approximately four years ago, so I think that's about 14 years ago now, in St. Catharines, Ontario, the newspaper headlines read one day, $500 paid for disposing of TV. The article went on to say that a study was done in Detroit in which the goal was to find out to what degree people are controlled by TV. 250 families were scientifically selected from various races and classes to be offered $500 if they would live without their TV set for one month. After 30 days, they could take it back in and receive $500 free. Out of 250, only 50 families agreed to do it. How many families made it through this trial of 30 days? It was eight. The other 42 forfeited their $500 sometime during the month. One family took their TV back on the 29th day. The eight who made it through were interviewed extensively. All eight said it brought their family closer together without TV. Six fathers said they first learned to know their children. One father said, the day that I disposed of our TV was the first day in 25 years that no one was killed in our living room. No sirens screamed, no shots rang out, no artificial merriment told us when to laugh, and no one slashed anyone else. And what was now the final result of those eight families of whom seven said their family life was considerably more rewarding without TV? The last line of the article tells us all eight families took the TV back in. We are enslaved to the television. We are enslaved by modern media. And it's very, very dangerous. And then Dr. Beaky, he goes on, and he shows us how um, television breaks all Ten Commandments. So I strongly encourage you um, to get this. And one more thing that I'd, I'd just like to read to you, and this is just kind of statistics on what TV is, and, and these are very similar uh, to what I have, although the statistics that I've found and I've done some research on, they are... There's still more time being spent than Dr. Beaky says here, but I like the way he puts it. He says the average TV viewer spends five and a half hours daily watching TV. And today, by the way, that is the average, uh, the average household has a TV playing for six hours and 47 minutes a day. The average person watches TV or other social media, like, like behind a screen, watching, or like being on the computer, playing video games, it's about six hours a day. So it's gone up half an hour, the average rate has gone up half an hour in the last roughly 10 years. By the time an average American youth becomes 65 years old, he will have spent 14 years of his life watching TV compared to one year in church. Sunday school and catechism if he comes faithfully to all. In the USA, children three to five years old spend about 40, 54 hours every week watching TV, which is 64% of their time awake. Uh, when the average graduate from high school receives his diploma at 17 years of age, he will have spent 11,000 hours of his life in school, but 22,000 hours watching TV. He, she averages three and a half hours of watching time before turning the TV off. Every time you watch, it's about three and a half hours before you finally turn your TV off again. Children are glued to TV for an average time of two and a half hours per sitting, yet it is not one and a half hours in the house of God often too long. And I think, and that's, that's where the rubber hits the road. An hour and a half in church, we're done. We want to get out. But two and a half hours before we finally turn the TV back off. Now, outside of sleeping, the average American will spend more time in his life watching TV than anything else. Yes, even more than working. Do we not have a teleholic society with respect to our precious God-given time? So TV is, as shown here, has many dangerous strings attached to it. It is an idol. And it's a worldly idol. And the one that we've taken in our homes and that we freely let our children, often freely let our children watch. Um, and why is this so bad? Especially for children 
two and under, in the first two years of a child, child's life, that's when they learn the most. They learn the basic skills, the basic rules, basic everything for what they're going to learn throughout, the, uh, throughout their life. So if we're going to fill them with information, worldly information, we're going we're to show them all the killings and all the violence and, and all the other sins that are portrayed on TV in their first two years. That's who they're going to be for the rest of their lives unless God graciously intervenes. And TV has a negative ch- effect on your child's brain. They don't develop a good imagination. You've got all the picture in front of you. All you have to do is just stare at it. All the, the action, all the scenery, all the events, everything is portrayed in a picture. And all you have to do is just wash it and take it in. And especially when playing video games, children and, and adults as well, we, all, we learn to be very self-centered. We do things, we can do, we can do it all by ourselves. We don't have to sit in a room and play with someone else, like play a game with someone else. We don't have to um, have good conversations anymore. All we have to do is just turn the screen on. We can play games by ourselves. We can watch things by ourselves. And we're learning to be very self-centered. We've got a very self-centered world today that we live in. Uh, people, people rotate their lives all around themselves. Me is the most important. And <laughs> that's actually, we can see that. If you, if you look at Apple, Apple has taken that very beautifully. They've got now the iPad, the iPhone, it's the whatever, the i stuff that they've got, the iPod, everything they've got. So what do we do about this? My first recommendation to you is get rid of your TV. Get rid of your screen media. Get rid of your video games and computer games. And Christ said, he said in um, somewhere in Matthew, I, I don't have the exact verse, but that if, you're, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. For it is better to enter the kingdom of God blind than with both eyes and be cast into the hellfire forever. And I sometimes wonder how literally we can take that. But I think when it comes to screen media and, and media, we've got to take it very literally. We've got to take that TV and just throw it away. For it is better never to watch TV again and, and, and go to heaven and to spend eternity with God than to have all the pleasure, all the the selfish gratification in watching TV and playing video games would be cast into hellfire forever. Now, one of the, the approaches I think that we can take, um, and that's, that's what I try to do, is good books, good reading material, stuff that children can read and enjoy, something that they will be motivated by. And good stories have so many values. They, it builds character. And children, they, they can, they'll read these books and um, they look at how other people, people in the book, the main character, had problems they've got to solve. And, and good books will show that from a good Christian, godly perspective, how we not only have to just do it because it's better for me. Okay, that's a bad reason. We've got to do it because it brings more glory to God by doing what he says. And stories and and reading books will teach our children of men and women who have gone before us. And that is very, very important. I'd like to read with you um, two passages from Scripture. If you have your Bibles, uh, please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I'd love to read the whole chapter. I don't know how much time we have. Um, but anyway, we'd like to start at, at verse 1 in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's quite a classic homeschool chapter. Uh, I think a lot of homeschoolers they like to use this and say this is why we homeschool. But there's a lot in this chapter. So Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. So we've got to teach our children the fear of the Lord. We've got to teach them the commandments of God, that our days may be long in the land which the Lord our God shall give us. Hear therefore, O Israel, verse 3, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee, the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, 
and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of the house, and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him, and shalt swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. And one of the main gods that we have today is television. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. And um, then jump on, let's go to um, verse 20. And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in to give us a land which he sware unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this, at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. And there we have a commandment for storytelling. We're reading good books. We've got to teach our children of men and women who've gone before us. We've got to teach them of the great and wondrous acts which God has done. Stories will encourage them. It will motivate them. And stories do build imagination. When we read books or when we hear stories being told, we've got to imagine the picture. We've got to imagine the scenery. We imagine what the person looks like. And we imagine the situations. And we, we've got a picture in our minds. And that is very useful and necessary, I would argue, for especially when, when men grow up and take on jobs, that they can see the work that they need to do before they have to be told. We, we have so many men, and I, and I run into them all the time, and I work with them quite a bit as well, who don't have the initiative in them to do anything. You've got to tell exactly, step by step, what they need to do. It's because they have no imagination. And probably they don't have any imagination because they've been watching television all their lives and playing video games. And when we tell stories, and when we read books to them, it teaches them to sit still and pay attention. And that's very important for children. Children like to move around, be free, and have fun. And those are all good things. But there's a time when they've got to sit still. When we take them at home, and we teach them to sit still, when we tell them stories, when we read God's word, we can train them to sit still in church for at least an hour and a half. And good stories broaden their horizons. They learn new words. You read books, you tell them stories, and people who are very good at storytelling, they can, they can kind of gear it that they start adding new words so that their children, they, they pick out a new word, and, and they learn, they, so you, you, you um, broaden their vocabulary, which is very important. Uh, there's, a, there's a classic homeschool t-shirt that's out as, is um, I'm a homeschooler, and, but I'll try to use small words. And I don't know if you, I haven't really seen them around here, but some of the homeschool conferences, a lot of people wear those. Um, there's, there's a company that sells those homeschool t-shirts. But that homeschoolers, they use, like using big words, especially ones that have read a lot. And by reading books and telling them stories, they learn of new places, people, and things. Um, I feel like I've been all over the world. I've, I've read books from, about Australia. I've read books in, in the Second World War in, in Europe. In Europe. Um, but in South Africa during the Boer War, in Russia during the uh, time of Napoleon, in France, I feel like I've been there just because I read the books. And I've, I've learned of people. And one of my favorite heroes, and I think, I think we've 
we should all know about him. And his name, some people know about him, not all do, but his name is William of Orange. And William of Orange was an incredible man of God. And I think we need to teach our children about men like him. William of Orange, who, who gave everything he had for the freedom of his country and for the freedom to serve God. And he was, he was a Protestant, although he never came out openly and said that, but he was a Protestant. And he was raised by King Philip of Spain, who was, Spain was a domineering force in Europe. They're very Roman Catholic, and they tried to subdue, especially the Netherlands, under Roman Catholicism as well. And William of Orange, from I think when he was about 12, 13, he was raised by King Philip of Spain. And he adopted the, the Catholic faith, and he, he lived it until he was close to his 20s, when there was a procession in the streets. And he's looking out the window in the palace, and he's just looking out. And there the soldiers come, and they've got a, a woman who they've, they've bound, and they take her to the, to the market square, they set her up on a stake and they burn her. And William of Orange saw that and he said, if that's the faith that I'm worshiping, he said, I want nothing to do with it. And he became one of the great men that God's used, even for our country, even for America. Humanly speaking, I believe if William of Orange had not lived, most of the world today would still be, be forced in, under Roman Catholicism. But William of Orange, he fought for freedom. We've got to teach our children about men like this, men that have gone before us. We've got to inspire them. And our children should desire to be like that. To be men and women that God can use for our country's good. And if reading, if you give your children books to read, it also increases their reading skills, which is one of the academic education, I think, that most of you are quite interested in. But the ultimate goal was storytelling. And I think this is one we've give, we've never, we should never forget. The ultimate, goal, and, and the ultimate goal of all of our life is to bring glory to God. We are creatures. He is creator. And we've got to live our lives in such a way that when we enter the streets, we enter the world, that people can see on us that we are children of God. When Moses was on the mountain, he was talking to God. And he, Moses kind of, a, I've got this picture that Moses kind of said to God that, um, you know, I've, I've seen uh, great miracles. I've seen the burning bush. I've seen all these great miracles that God has shown. But he says, I've never seen God. Well, God says, no one shall see me and live. But God says, I will put you in the cleft of a rock. And I will put my hand over your eyes. And when I pass by, you can see my backside. And when Moses saw the backside of God, his face shone with radiance. And it was so bright that when he came down the mountain, people couldn't stand to look at him. He had to put a veil over his face. That is the image of God that we should be presenting to the world. We don't go into the world like everyone else. We've got to talk differently. The talk of the world is slanderous and blasphemous. We've got to dress differently. So, so many people today, and, and I think that's one of the, the, I think a lot of people may just not realize this, but there's a lot of immodesty. And homeschoolers are very prone to that as well. So we've got to dress differently. We've got to talk differently. We've got to act differently. We've just simply got to be different. We're not called to be like the world. But we're called to be a light set on a hill that shines and, and, and gives light to all those around. And there's a story that needs to be told to our children. We've got to prepare them to tell it to others around them. And that's a story that began in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning was God. And God created heaven and earth and all that in the midst. And he created man in his image and after his own likeness. And then man, thinking to be wiser than God, ate of the forbidden fruit. And yet God did not leave man in their state of sin. But throughout the Old Testament, we see a pattern of redemption where God gave them the promise 
of a Savior. And he took them. And he, with Abraham, he established a covenant with Abraham. And with his seed. And we see that with Jacob. And then when Jacob and his sons went to Israel, or to Egypt. And they were in Egypt for 400 years. Yet, when they were being oppressed, God took them out of Egypt. He took them out of the land of slavery. And he took them to the promised land. God has never forsaken us. And yet we so often forsake God. We are a stubborn and rebellious people. But this story, and throughout the whole Old Testament, we see a picture of God's redemption. And that redemption was fulfilled ultimately in God's Son, Jesus Christ. That story needs to be told. And we can tell that story in many ways. We can just tell that story by telling of people that have lived and just, just kind of working it in there. We can tell that story in so many different ways. We can tell it by telling Bible stories. And, but by, the history continues. After Christ was crucified, we have great men that rose up. Leaders in the church of God. And history continues. And if we do not know our history, we will be very likely, and I would almost say guaranteed, to make the same mistakes again. And it is said, history is a shadow we live in today. But what we do today will change the history of tomorrow. And if we do not know the history of yesterday, we shouldn't be surprised when we see the exact same things happen. We don't have to make all the mistakes. They've been made for us. We've, got, we've had men and women who've gone before us who've done all those dumb things. We don't have to do them anymore. We can learn from their mistakes if we only knew about them. And so we teach our children the history of God's redemptive love and work that was ultimately fulfilled in his son but that continues throughout the ages of the world. We've got to teach our children the fear of the Lord. And that comes through all of that. And that's what Deuteronomy chapter 6 says that when your son asks of these things, we've got to teach them. We've got to teach them what it is to serve God. And then one more um, passage that I'd like to read with you, and that's Psalm 78. And Psalm 78 is verse, um, verse 4a. That's our, um, our slogan, I guess, or that we go by. And showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord. That's our goal. That's what we want to do with our books. But I'd like to read um, a part of Psalm 78, um, also beginning at verse 1. I give ear, O my people, to my law, incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, a story. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generations to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God, to not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law and forget his works and his wonders that he had showed them. And why is it? Why did they, for, why did they do all these evil things? Very likely, because they didn't know the history. They didn't know where they'd come from. That's why they did the exact same things again. And Israel has done that time and time and time again. That they... They'd reject God and they'd go after the idols of the world. And then God in his grace sent Babylon and Syria and all these other nations to suppress them. To hold them in captivity so that they would once again turn back to God and worship him alone. They forget his works, his wonders that he had showed them. And marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea. He caused them to pass through, and he made the water stand as a heap. And he goes on. The psalmist goes on. And the whole psalm is full of the wonderful, marvelous works which God has done. 
is it's teach them to our children. They're not optional. They're necessary. And we've got to teach them. And we can teach them through storytelling. We can teach them by giving them good books to read. We've got to instill in them a desire to follow the example of the godly men and women that God has sent before us. And that is our, that is our purpose. I would like to share with you a story that I find incredibly moving, incredibly motivating. And it's the story of Roland Taylor. Now, how many here are familiar with the Fox's Book of Martyrs? Anybody know Fox's Book of Martyrs? This is, I believe it's chapter 14. And it's the story of Roland Taylor. And Roland Taylor, he was a man after God's own heart. Uh, he worshipped God, he served God, and he did a lot of good. He set a lot of, of good examples. And I'd like to, to share that story with you today. It is a cold winter day. We're standing in the market square in the city of Hudley in London, England. In front of us is a beautiful church. Now, who's the minister of that church? It's Dr. Roland Taylor. Well, who's Dr. Roland Taylor? Let's go to his house and we'll find out. So as we approach, we peer in through a window and we see a table that has been prepared. And Dr. Taylor stands there at the table and he says, before we partake of this food, let us first see, go to the door and see if there's any who are not as blessed as we are. And they go to the door and there's a widow with six children. They take them in and they give them all the food they need even if that means that Dr. Taylor and his family won't have any food for supper. They help those who are in need. That's Dr. Taylor, a gracious and humble man, well-beloved by his congregation. And yet, Dr. Taylor is not loved so well by everyone. A new queen has risen to the throne in England, Mary, bloody Mary. And Mary hates the Protestants. She desires that every single one of them be killed. And one day, Bloody Mary sends a priest to Hadley, England, to Dr. Taylor's church. And he goes there to administer the Mass. So Dr. Taylor is sitting in his, in his room. And all of a sudden he hears a church bell ringing. Unaware of what's going on, he stands up and runs to the church, followed by his wife, but is unable to get in due to the crowd. But he knows another way. And he crawls in he, through a back door and he goes up into the church and there to his horror he sees a priest administering the mass. And in anger he cries out, Oh you villain, how dare you abuse the house of God so? And the priest gets angry and his two helpers, he commands to cast Dr. Taylor out. So they grab Dr. Taylor and they throw him on the street Mrs. Taylor, she falls on her knees and she begs that he may be let go. But they pick her up and throw her out as well. A few weeks later, Dr. Taylor is summoned to appear before the Council of Bishops in London. His friends beg and plead with him not to go. But Dr. Taylor says, God will either save me from suffering or he will give me the strength to bear it. And so Dr. Taylor goes and appears before the Council of Bishops. When he walks in, the head bishop starts yelling at him and raging at him, calling him knave and, and sinner and hypocrite and, and blasphemer of God in his church. Dr. Taylor just stands there quietly. And finally he says, I have come, your honor, to see what you need me for. And the bishop cries, Have you come indeed? Do you not know who I am? Dr. Taylor responds, Yes, I know who you are. You are a persecutor of the people of God. At this, the bishop, enraged, commands that Dr. Taylor be cast into prison. And before he's thrown in prison, he has an opportunity to speak to his family. And this is what he says, I say to my wife and to my children, The Lord gave you unto me, and the Lord hath taken me from you, and you from me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I believe that they are blessed which die in the Lord. 
God careth for sparrows and for the hairs of our head. I have ever found him more faithful and favorable than is any father or husband. Trust ye therefore in him by the means of our dear Savior, Christ's merits. Believe, love, fear, and obey him. Pray to him, for he hath promised to help. Count me not dead, for I shall certainly live and never die. I go before and shall follow after, and you shall follow after to our eternal home. I go to the rest of my children, Susan, George, Ellen, Robert, and Zachary. I bequeath you to the only omnipotent. After this, he's cast into prison. And he's in prison for about a year and a half when he's transferred to another prison. And he's, he's told that he will be taken back to Hudley town where he will be burned at the stake. While he's in this prison, his wife and, and his son, they come, and I think two daughters were there as well. It's not all the way recorded. Uh, but they come to have meal with him. And the guard is gracious and lets him in. After supper, he says, he turns to his son and says, My dear son, Almighty God, bless thee and give thee his Holy Spirit to be a true servant of Christ, to learn his word and constantly to stand by his truth all thy life long. And my son, see that thou fear God always, flee from all sin and wicked living, be virtuous, serve God with daily prayer and apply thy book. In any wise, see that thou be obedient to thy mother, love her and serve her, be, be ruled by her now in thy youth and follow her good counsel in all things. Beware of lewd company, of young men that fear not God, but follow their lewd lusts and vain appetites. Flee from whoredom and hate all filthy living, remembering that I, thy father, do die in the defense of holy marriage. Another day when God shall bless thee, love and cherish the poor people, and count that thy chief riches is to be rich in alms. And when thy mother is waxed old, forsake her not, but provide for her to thy power, and see that she lack nothing. For so will God bless thee and give thee long life upon earth and prosperity, which I pray God to grant thee. And then turning to his wife, he says, My dear wife, I need not tell thee to continue steadfast in the faith. I have tried to be unto thee a faithful yoke fellow, and so hast thou been to me. For the which I doubt not, my dear, but God will reward thee. Now the time is come that I am to be taken away, and thou shalt be freed from the wedlock bond. Therefore I will give thee my counsel, what I think best for thee. Thou art yet a young and comely woman, and therefore it may be proper for thee to marry again. For doubtless thou wilt not be able thyself alone to support our dear children, nor be out of trouble till thou art married. Therefore should providence bring to thee some good, honest man, willing to support the poor children, marry him, and live in the fear of God. In all this, Dr. Taylor did not think of himself. And even in the circumstances in which he was in, he yet wanted to take care of others and bring glory to God. The next night, he was taken by the sheriff and some other deputies, and he was taken to begin the journey to Headley, England. When they passed the, a church, his wife and his daughters were there waiting for him. But it was so dark they couldn't see him. They only heard the group approaching. And so his wife called out, Oh, Roland, Roland, where art thou? And Roland said, Here I am. And so his wife and his children, they went to him. And taking his daughter Mary in his arms, they knelt down and prayed the Lord's Prayer. At this sight, the sheriff and the men with him burst into tears. But yet they did not let Dr. Taylor go, and they took him along. And they took him to Hudley. Before they reached Hudley, they put a, a black cloak over his head so that people wouldn't recognize him. And yet, as I got close, a farmer standing by the way saw him and recognized him and said, Oh, Dr. Taylor, may God be gracious to thee as thou hast been gracious to me. And as I entered the streets of Hudley, the streets ran full of people who recognized him yet and cried, Oh, may, doctor, may God save thee, Dr. Taylor. When he was taken to the market square, he asked, where are we? And it was told him, we are in the, in the market square in Hudley. And he said, oh, thank God, I am near home. And then he asked for permission to speak, but it wasn't granted. So he tore the dark cloak off his head, and he ripped it up with his hands. And when the people saw his familiar 
face and white beard. They burst into tears. One lady ran to him and knelt down with him and they prayed together. But she was torn away from him and cast away. And doc, then Dr. Taylor saw a man who had been a lifelong enemy. And he called unto him and said, Come, sage, take my boots. I know you've wanted them for a long time. And so with these and other words, he took us clothes off and he gave them to the people around who had more need of them them than himself. But at this, Dr. Taylor, because he was forbidden to speak, he was uh, hit over the head. And then, when he realized that he was not given an opportunity to speak, he climbed into the barrel of pitch that was set there before him, and he stood up against the, the pole, and he was tied down. And at the stake he prayed, Merciful Father of Heaven, for Jesus' sake, receive my soul into thy hands. And at this, the butcher who was supposed to light the stake refused. And so some people in the town who were enemies of Dr. Taylor, they took fire and they threw it at him. And Sage took a burning piece of wood and hit him over the head. And he knocked his brains out, but he died that way. So God was indeed gracious to him. And that although he died, he lit, yet lived Dr. Taylor lived from October 6, 1510 through February 9, 1555. He was the third martyr that was killed by Queen Bloody Mary, Queen Mary. He left behind a wife and three children. Yet although he died, they knew that he could say with Job, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though worms destroy my body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. These are the stories that we need to pass on to our children. Stories of men like Dr. Taylor. He had a vision for his children. He understood what it was to influence the world in a good, godly, Christian way. And that's what he told his son. He says, beware of lewd company. Isn't that who we've got all around us? We've got to beware of them. And we've got to Spend our time with people, with God's people, people who will raise us, people who will mentor us, people who will guide us, that we may be godly young men and women. For that's, that's, what we are, that's why we're here. That's why God created us, to bring glory to him. I'd like to share with you a poem that, was, that is uh, written on Dr. Taylor's memorial. And they don't know who wrote it, but it's a beautiful poem. And it goes... Of Roland Taylor's fame and show, an excellence divine, doctor of the civil law, a preacher rare and fine, King Henry and King Edward Day's preacher and parson here, that gave to God continual praise and kept his flock in fear. For the truth condemned to die, he was in fiery flame, where he received patiently the torment of the same, and strongly suffered to the end, which made the standers by. Rejoice in God to see their friend and pastor so to die. O Taylor, were thy mighty fame uprightly here enrolled, thy deeds deserve that thy good name were ciphered here in gold. And there's more men. There's more stories. And these are stories that we can share. And we can do that by reading good books. And when we read good books, we can teach them to our children as well. Um, there's a few points of application that I like to make. And one, as I already said, get rid of your TV. Get rid of all that screen media, all that worldly media that has been infiltrated into our homes. Get rid of it. We don't need it. We've got to examine everything. We've got to examine and, and, take, and look and all the things that we do, all the areas around us, and say, how is this that I'm doing right now bringing glory to God? And if it doesn't, get rid of it. We've got to limit our time that we do need to spend on the computer and, and do things. We've got to do it for the right reasons, though. And I would strongly encourage you all to have a family reading time or storytelling time where you come together as a family and... You read books together, 
or you tell stories. And the Word of God is a very good place to start. We've, we've all got that, and there's many stories in there. And we've got to tell these stories to our children. We've got to pass them on for generations to come. And last but not least, buy books from Inheritance Publications. We've got Christian literature, and our goal is to put in your hands books that you can give your children, that you can read with your children, that you can read aloud, that they can read for themselves, and books that tell them of stories of men and women who have given their lives and given everything they had for the freedom that we still have today. And if we want to see a change in the world around us, we've got to do something. We've got to stand up and we've got to teach our, our boys to grow up and be men that they can look at this, these positions of leadership that they see in the church, in the state, but especially in the family. And we've got to teach our men to take responsibility and take it, responsibility seriously that they see those positions of leadership and that they train by working hard, by being diligent to prepare to be also leaders. And in, in Alberta, where, where I live, it's very sad. But when we have political meetings and, and different events where politicians speak, generally there's very few young people. If there's young people, normally it's our family. And my sister, my older sister, she said, you know, if, if we can just teach especially homeschooled children to be interested in politics and in, in these things that are going on, in 20 or 30 years, they're the only people that are interested. And maybe we'll see some of them rising up into maybe become the president in 30 years from now. Because very few people are still interested. They don't care. And we've got to care. Because it's not our nation. It's God's nation. And so I would encourage you all to get books, and read to your children, tell them stories, and raise up young men and women who will bring glory to God. Thank you.